How many of you can't wait to see Jesus? I know I can't wait to see him. Especially when you turn on the news and you look around and there's so much evil in the world. People dying, there's sickness, there's suffering, there's wars, natural disasters, political chaos. So knowing that Jesus is coming soon and one day we will see him in that second coming, it gives us hope. But what if I were to say to you this morning that you could see him before that second coming? How many of you would be interested in seeing him? How many of you are probably sitting here wondering, has Pastor Crystal lost her mind? What kind of theology or doctrine is that? Or maybe there are some of you who are wondering, how can I see him? You know, every time when I have to share a message, I always pray and I share this with you all the time. I pray and I ask God, what is the message that you want me to share with your people? And he always gives me a word first for me because I need to be confronted and convicted with the message. So this morning I share with you from the topic that the Holy Spirit laid on my heart. Have you seen him? Have you seen him? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Kind Father, Lord, I want to thank you so much for your blessings. And I thank you for this opportunity to stand before your people to share this message that you laid on my heart. This message that you convicted me of. So I pray, God, that all those who are under the sounding of my voice, those who are watching online, those who will watch in the future, when they hear this message, I pray that your Holy Spirit will touch them in the same way that I was touched. So I ask, God, at this time that you will hide me behind the cross, that everything that is shared will not be about me, but would only be about you. So Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, because God, you are my strength and my redeemer. These mercies I ask in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So again, the question, have you seen him? I'm gonna be honest and vulnerable with you. Since the year began, I have been examining my personal walk with God. And I've been praying earnestly for a deeper connection. Because no matter where you are, you can always go deeper. And I've been earnestly saying to God, I want to experience you in a more meaningful way, in a deeper way. I want to know the experience that Enoch had. You know, when the Bible says that Enoch walked with God. He walked with God so closely that the Bible says that God took him. In Hebrews 11 verse 5, it says, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he did not see death. He could not be found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, the Bible says, he was commended as one who pleased God. As one who did what? As one who pleased God. So I found myself thinking, what does it mean to please God? Is it more prayer? Is it more church attendance? Is it more commandment keeping? What does pleasing God actually look like? To the point that Enoch got where, where God recognized he didn't even belong in this earth anymore. I'm going to take him. So I looked in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, written by Ellen G. White, and said this, Enoch's walk with God was not in a trance or a vision, but it was in all the duties of his daily life. So in everything that Enoch did, he pleased God. It said he didn't become a hermit, shutting himself entirely off from the world, for he recognized that he had a work to do for God in the world. In his family interactions, in his interactions with his fellow men as a husband, as a father, as a friend, it goes on to say that Enoch, he was a steadfast, unwavering servant. And then in an article that I read in the Review and Herald, December 1889, it said this about Enoch, that Enoch was one in mind with God. And it went on to say that if we are one in mind with God, then our will will be swallowed up in the will of God. 
So as I sat in reflection, reading about Enoch and reading about these insights that I now was able to come across, it actually brought me to a deeper place of saying, well, God, I want to experience that. And I felt the Holy Spirit leading me to the text that we're going to focus on today in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. And I will read it in your hearing. And the Bible says this, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him he shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a sheep divideth his sheep from as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, on which side? On his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. I was naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. And then the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry and fed thee, or thirsty and gave you a drink? When saw we you a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the Bible says in verse 40, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as he have done it unto the least of these, unto who? Unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye did not take me in. I was naked, and ye gave me no clothes. I was sick, and you did not visit me. I was in prison, you did not visit me. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto you? Then the king answered them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And the chapter ends with this verse. And these shall go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now this passage is a very powerful passage. And it's interesting that when we read this passage in Matthew chapter 25, right before Matthew chapter 25 is Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew chapter 24, we learn about the signs of the times that's preceding the second coming of Jesus. It makes us excited when we see the signs of the times. But then immediately in Matthew chapter 25, the focus is now on the behaviors of those that are ready for the second coming versus the behavior of those that are not. And as you think about the order of this, the order in which Jesus is sharing this, it is very intentional because everything that Jesus does is intentional. See, while Jesus shears and prepares them for what is about to come, he places a special emphasis in Matthew 25 on what will happen if we're ready or if we're not ready. So Matthew 25, when we look at it, when we examine it, it contains three distinct parables. How many? Three distinct parables in Jesus teaching now his followers how they can be ready and the consequences if they are not ready. 
In the first part of Matthew chapter 25, we see the parable of the ten virgins. And that teaches the importance of being spiritually ready, the importance of having our oil, the importance of having the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to another parable that talks about the talents, the gifts and talents that God has given us. And that if we don't use our talents, then we will, use, we will lose our talents, that we have accountability to God for the way in which we use our talents. And we will also be accountable for the talents that we do not use. And in Matthew 25, it ends with this now last parable, our sermonic text, which we just read. It's the parable of the sheep and the goats, which reveals the final judgment that will take place. And in this parable, we see a clear distinction between the actions of those that are ready to meet Jesus when he comes and those that are not ready to meet him when he comes. And as we examine this text more closely, we notice that the Son of Man, which is Jesus, is the judge. So in this judgment, Jesus is the judge. And we notice that Jesus is the one that is separating the people. We also notice that there are two classifications of people. How many classifications? There's two, the sheep and the goats. And it's important for us to understand that because there is no middle ground. Either you will be sheep or you are a goat. The sheep represent the righteous and will be placed on the right hand of God. And the goats represent the unrighteous and will be placed on the left. So as we read this parable, I want us to examine, well, what are the characteristics of the sheep? What are the characteristics of the goat? Because if it is truly our desire to see Jesus when he comes, and if we want to see him even before he comes, that we need to examine the characteristics of the sheep, the ones that he is coming back for. So I want to share with you four distinct characteristics of the sheep and four distinct characteristics of the goat. So the sheep. The first characteristic is that the sheep, they are compassionate. They are what? They are compassionate. See, the sheep, they do more than just feel a deep sense of empathy for the hungry, for the thirsty, for the naked, for the sick, for those that are in prison. The sheep are motivated by a call to action. The sheep, they actually serve. The sheep provide for the hungry and the thirsty. The sheep welcome the strangers. The sheep clothe the naked. The sheep care for the sick. The sheep visit the prisoners. These are all verbs and action words. The sheep don't just talk about what needs to be done or what should be done. The sheep actually do the work. Compassion is the primary character trait of the sheep. Another character trait of the sheep is that they are humble and selfless. See, the sheep serve without seeking any kind of recognition or any kind of reward. The Bible says to us, when Jesus actually commends them for the work that they did, they were actually surprised. You see it in scripture. They said, Lord, when saw we thee hungry and fed thee? When did we see you thirsty and gave you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and took you in? When did we see you naked and clothe thee? See, it is evident from the scripture that the sheep were serving from a genuine place. They weren't looking for any type of recognition. They were serving based on the need that they saw. And that is the reason why they served. It was from a place of being selfless, a place from humility. The third character trait that I wanna focus on with the sheep is that they were obedient. What were they? They were obedient. The sheep, they were obedient to the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus makes it clear that we need to care for the least of these. Their actions represented obedience. See, obedience, it requires action. The Bible says that we must not simply be hearers of the word, but we need to be doers of the word. 
And the last character trait that's really, really important with the sheep, they had spiritual vision. What did they have? Spiritual vision. See, the sheep, they reflect the characteristics of the shepherd. They see as Jesus sees. When we see the world through the eyes of Jesus, then everything begins to change. Instead of pain, we see purpose. Instead of opposition, we see opportunity. Instead of fear, we see freedom. Instead of hate, we see love. So the character traits of the sheep, it demonstrates one who recognizes the importance of living a life of service. That our life on this earth, it's not just about me, that we were created to serve. Serving not because of obligation, but as an outflow from a personal relationship with Jesus. So we have an understanding of the sheep. But now let's compare it to the characteristics of the goats. See, the goats are also characterized by a few traits. The first trait, lack of compassion. See, it's the opposite of the sheep. The goats in this story are condemned for their failure to show compassion. They did not provide for the hungry or the thirsty. They did not welcome the strangers. They did not clothe the naked. They did not care for the sick. They did not visit the prisoners. The goats, they never even recognized the need. Or maybe they just thought that the sheep already had it covered. The second trait of the goats is that they were indifferent to the needs of others. See, the goats... They demonstrated a disregard for the well-being of the least of these. They figured themselves, the goats, that they were probably okay because they weren't causing any harm to the least of these. But I want you to know, church, that indifference, indifference is a dangerous character trait. Because while they may not have caused harm to the least of these, they didn't do anything. It's like seeing someone has a need and you just pass them by. And many of us think that because we're not doing bad, then we're okay. But indifference is even worse. Martin Luther King once said this quote. He said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. That's indifference. The third trait of the goats was self-centeredness. See, the goats, they focus more on themselves and hence the inability to see those that were around them that had needs. In fact, they were surprised when you read it in scripture, they were surprised when Jesus said to them that they did not provide for the hungry, that they did not give water to the thirsty, that they did not welcome the strangers, that they did not clothe the naked. They weren't even aware that the least of these were around them because they were so focused on themselves. And the last character trait, where we saw the sheep, they had spiritual vision. The goats, they were spiritually blind. What were they? They were spiritually blind. The goats did not reflect the character traits of the shepherd. They couldn't see as Jesus sees. Because while their eyes were fully opened, they were spiritually blind. So the character traits now of the goats, as we look at this passage, they had an awareness of who Jesus was, but there was no depth of relationship. And that's a dangerous place to be in because the goats, they actually had expectations to see Jesus. And they were surprised at the outcome of their faith. So when we look at these two categories, the sheep and the goats, both of them knew who Jesus was. Both of them knew who Jesus was. Both of them referred to Jesus as Lord when you look at the text. Both of these groups looked forward to his coming, but only one group was truly ready. Both of these groups wanted to see Jesus, but only one group actually saw Jesus and it made them prepared for him. The group on the right, the sheep, they received the invitation to come. 
Whereas the group on the left, the goats, they were told to depart from me. So it makes you wonder, at least it made me wonder, how could one be in the presence of Jesus and still be so blind? Might that be us? Might we be coming to church from week to week, doing all the traditional things that we normally do, but we're unable to see him? Hence the question, have you seen him? You know, almost two months ago, we experienced an eclipse. Did anyone see the eclipse? It was April 8th, 2024. And some of us traveled far and wide. I know there are some members that had a chance to travel to actually see the total eclipse. And I decided to do some research on it because this was actually, I mean, I heard of eclipse, but it was my first time actually watching one. I said, you know, I want to actually see this. This solar eclipse in particular was noteworthy because of the scale and because of the impact and the rarity of this eclipse. See, the path of totality covered a wide range within the United States. It went from Texas to the Midwest all the way up to Canada. In fact, it's saying that this eclipse was so rare that the next eclipse like this one in our territory, in the contiguous United States, is going to be 20 years from now. And they predict that date to be August 23rd, 2044. So I was wondering for myself, why was this phenomenon so rare? And I decided to do some research and I looked up under the National Weather Service. And here's the reasons why, some of the reasons why. It was the alignment of the orbits. So the orbit of the Earth around the Sun and then the orbit of the Moon around the Earth, they're not perfectly aligned. In fact, the Moon's orbit is inclined about five degrees in comparison to the Earth's orbit around the sun. So from our perspective and from our vantage point, the moon is either passing above or below the sun, and that's what results in a missed eclipse. So for the eclipse to occur, it has to be perfectly aligned. The other thing is the size of the moon. From our perspective on Earth, the size of the moon and the sun appears to be about the same, but we know that they're vastly different in size. But because of the elliptical of the moon, of how it rotates, the distance from the Earth varies as it rotates around the Earth. So when the moon is now at the closest point to the Earth in orbit, and I learned this term, it's called the perigee. Some of you scientists might know all these things. It can appear large enough to cover the sun. So at the closest point, that's how it's able to see like it's covering the sun. And the other thing is the narrow path of totality. So even when a total eclipse does occur, the path of totality is very narrow, usually about 100 miles. So that means only a small fraction of the Earth's surface gets to experience the total eclipse. So when you think about all these things, you can see why the eclipse was such a big deal. The heavens truly declare the glory of God. Now, for those of us who were in Maryland, like myself, I didn't travel to see anything, we were able to experience a partial eclipse. And I was told the spot where I went to view it, that I need to get there early because a lot of people were going to come. It was like downtown Silver Spring. And I remember when I got out there, I saw this couple at the entrance and they looked like they had been camping out there for a while to see this eclipse. And they were so excited. So I went and I found my seat, brought my chair where I was going to sit. And then I realized I didn't have any glasses. So someone next to me, she said, you know, take my glasses. And when I put them on and I looked and I could see how amazing this eclipse actually was. It was a wonderful and amazing experience. So after the eclipse was almost over, it, you know, it took place, and I was finally getting ready to leave, I saw the couple that I had met earlier that was, that was sitting in the, in the entryway. So she says to me, what was so amazing about it? I said, what do you mean what was so amazing? Like, didn't you see? She had been sitting there before I got there, her and her husband. And she said, we had been looking and looking and wondering. Everyone was talking about this eclipse, but they hadn't seen anything. So I asked her, I said, well, did you have glasses? She didn't have glasses. So I handed her my glasses. And when she put them on, 
She says, wow. Now the eclipse had already taken place, but now it was moving back in the other direction. So she was still able to see what was happening. She handed them to her husband and he's like, wow. They couldn't believe that all this time they were sitting there, but because they didn't have the glasses, they couldn't see. So while they had eyes, they couldn't see. But when they saw through those glasses, it made the difference. So I ask you all the question, have you seen him? Have you seen Jesus or are you just like that couple that was physically present but not really seeing what needed to be seen? See, there's nothing wrong, my friends. There's nothing, church family, in looking forward to the second coming of Jesus because that is what gives us hope. When we look around at the evil in this world, we're like, Jesus, we're looking forward to seeing your coming. But my question for us today is this. Are you passively waiting for him to come like the goats? Or are you actively waiting for him to come like the sheep? My church family, I don't want us to be so distracted by the signs of Jesus' the second coming that you miss the opportunity to see Jesus while you wait for him. See, we miss opportunities to see Jesus when we're not focused on the things that really matter. We miss opportunities to see Jesus when we ignore the least of these. We miss opportunities to see Jesus when we refuse to serve. The sheep, the sheep saw Jesus because they served the least of these. And Jesus, he identifies with the least of these. He said plainly this, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. So Jesus is saying to us, if you want to experience me in a deeper way, in a more meaningful way, if you want to see me, then you've got to serve. Jesus lists these six conditions, hunger, thirst, alienation, nakedness, sickness, imprisonment. These, they all represent what a person might have that are central to their survival and to their quality of life. But before a person can fully experience the gospel, if they are dealing with any of those needs, they need to be met first. And this is where we come in being the hands and the feet of Jesus, as Delaney mentioned the children's story. Jesus doesn't need us to be the hands and feet, but he invites us to be the hands and feet because through that invitation, we are able to experience him in a deeper way. The ones who we serve will see Jesus through us. And by us serving, we will see Jesus through them. I remember recently, a group of us went to a nearby nursing home to visit, to bring joy and to sing. And there's a separate group called the, um, it's like those who, for those who, it's called memory care. I just remembered, memory care. <laughs> Imagine that. I hope that doesn't mean I'm going to end up in memory care. <laughs> but that, so there was one large unit for all of the participants and then another separate section for those with memory care. So I sang a few songs while we were there. And there was a guy that I met by the name of George. And when I walked in, I asked him what his name, he said, George. And we only stayed with them with that memory care group, maybe about 20 minutes or so. And when we were leaving, we you know, shook hands and talked with the different um, members at the, at the nursing home. And I said, bye George, see you next time. And George's face lit up and he said, how did you know my name? He was so happy that I knew his name. And George forgot that he told me his name just 20 minutes ago. But the smile on his face, because I called him by name, it then warmed my heart by serving him. So he was blessed and I was blessed through this act of service. And then it dawned on me very clearly Crystal, you are saying you want a deeper connection with me. The deeper connection, it comes through service. It comes through serving the least of these. So my prayer for us, Brunchable Church, 
is that God will open our eyes so that we can see as Jesus sees. Because when our spiritual eyes are not open, we will see him. We will recognize the opportunities to serve. We will see that homeless person who needs some food to eat. We will see that widower who needs someone to talk to. We will see that single mother or father that could use a helping hand. We will see that person who needs a word of encouragement. We will see that guest who is by themselves that may need a hug or a smile. We will see that person who is feeling invisible. So the hymn says to us, open my eyes that I may see. Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands that wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. So again, I ask the question, have you seen him? Or maybe the real question is, do you want to see him? Maybe you're here today. And you've never heard of this man named Jesus and you want to learn more about him. I invite you in your bulletins, there's a connection card or if you wanna feel so bold to stand to your feet or come down, I will meet you personally to pray with you. Or maybe you've heard about this man named Jesus and you've been thinking about baptism for a while and kind of on the fence with it. And you realize that now you need to make a decision for him. I invite you to make that decision. Do you want to be sheep or do you want to be goats? It's only two choices, make the decision. Or maybe you're here today and you wanna rededicate your life to Jesus with the commitment to serve. There's a song I grew up on that says, make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak and may the prayer of my heart always be, make me a servant today. So my prayer for us, Spencerville Church, for all family members, all guests that are here, is that God, that he will open your eyes all of our eyes so that we can see as Jesus sees. So when the question is asked, have you seen him? Then your answer will be yes. Definitely kind Father, Lord, I thank you for this message that you have laid on my heart. Lord, you have a way of convicting us with messages that are sometimes not easy, but you share it with us. You confront us with it because you love us. Because we recognize, Lord, that your coming is soon, that the signs of the times are there. And you want us all to be sheep, not goats. So Lord, I pray that for everyone under the sound of my voice that has heard this message, that they will feel inspired and motivated to serve. Because it's through serving that we develop a deeper connection with you. So we love you, Jesus. And we thank you for being such a merciful God towards us. Hear our prayer. See us and meet us where we are so that we can become what you want us to be. These mercies I ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.